For the wild narrative which I'm about to tell, I neither expect nor ask for belief. It would be mad to expect such a thing, in a case where my own senses reject their evidence. Yet I'm not mad, and I surely do not dream. I suppose you're the young master Mr. Aldwich waits for. <clears throat> Go ahead on in. There you are. You haven't just come. But it's exceedingly dangerous to traverse the coast this time of day. I'm so glad you came. I find that the pleasant company of my relations calms my nerves. It's a pastime of mine. By keeping my mind occupied, I attempt to dispel some of the constitutional agitation which afflicts me. Careful, I use a special thinner. The fumes can do all sort of damage to you. A painter I knew fairly went mad from it. Poor soul, he scratched out his own eyes in a fit of frenzy. His own eyes! Just watch that you keep the windows open. I have a surprise. Your brother Henry is here. He's upstairs visiting with the least even now. What a delightful time that was. Cousin, you've come. Oh, we're so happy. Oh, dear brother, delighted to see you. Please, join us. Henry has just been relating his adventures to me. He's been everywhere. But my travels are over. I'm ready to settle down. How did you find Uncle Edwin? We're worried about him. He is consumed by his paintings. Are you unwell? You look a little peaked. Revenge means nothing, unless the Avenger makes himself known to his victim. Of course, when one takes revenge, one wants to take it slowly. One wants to be avenged at length.
I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. It is a poor vengeance that also harms the Revenger. Sir? Return to the villa. Tell the livery that I shall be out all night. They are forbidden to leave the house. Yes, sir. Immediately, sir. Hmm, that will ensure their immediate disappearance, now that my back is turned. He has a weakness, this Fortunato. In some regards, he is a man to be respected, and even feared. Still, he has his weaknesses. For years I've suffered his injuries, but now he has ventured upon insult. Excuse me, aren't you Montresor? I'm afraid I don't know that gentleman. Oh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> My dear Fortunato, I wonder if you could help me. I've bought a small cask of what passes for Amontillado, but I have my doubts. Amontillado? But I have my doubts. <laughs> A cast, Montresor, and in the middle of carnival! Impossible. I have my doubts. I was foolish enough to pay full price without consulting Fortunato in the matter. Lucchese has a discerning palate. Perhaps he could take a sip. Bah! Lucchese can't tell Amontillado from gutter water. <laughs> oh, nice to see you. Nice to see <laughs> Who's that? No one, Signora. No one at all. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Oh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Let's go. Where? To your vaults. But surely your wife is looking for you. She'll see me soon enough. Let us go. Oh, the streets go dangerous at this hour. We will soon arrive at the safety of my villa. My friend, this is madness. You are afflicted with a severe cold. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us return. I'll consult Lucchese. The cold is nothing. Lucchese is an ignoramus. This way. The draft of Medoc will keep us from the damps. Enjoy. It will still the calm. Punish with impunity. Enjoy. It will still the calm. This way. He has a weakness. Come along. One wants to take it slowly. Therein lies the Amante.
What's this? It is very damp here. One last time, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must leave you. But first... Joke. An excellent joke. We'll have many laughs about it at the Palazzo over some wine. The Amontillado. Yes! <laughs> the Amontillado! <laughs> My wife will be looking for me. Let us be gone. Yes, let us be gone. For the love of God, Montessor! Yes, for the love of God. Fortunato? sick. It's due to the dampness. In pace requies. Cut! It must have been a dream. A dream dark and disturbing, a haunting dream. I was glad to find myself back in Edwin's silent home. It's a portrait of my mother. She died when I was quite young. God rest her soul. I suppose you might say she resembles Elise. Something about the eyes. Where is Elise? She's been spending far too much time with your brother.
I'm glad you've come. I have determined to ask Elise's hand. I know it's foolish, but my heart pounds so earnestly within. Surely you understand. I fear Edwin will be opposed. He dotes on her so, and he's always been contemptuous of my circumstances. Please, speak well of me to him. It means my whole life. I must speak with her. Bad dreams last night, did you? I won't hear of it. I simply won't hear of it. Edwin, please, see reason. She's far too young for you, for any man. Are you insane? She's your cousin, for God's sake. What of her wishes? Elise is confined to her room, indefinitely. And you, young man, stay clear of me. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know, by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with the love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in the kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, could Never dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee.
And so all the night died, I lay down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. Look at that fellow, haunting the shoreline. Chilling. The agreements are in place. Tomorrow is the day. Ciano, how I've waited for this moment. We'll be rich beyond imagination. Give her some wine. It's a lovely sauterne. <coughs> Young, straightforward, rather blunt, drinkable. <laughs> oh, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Wonderful custom, Signore Fortunato. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> can I get anything for you? It would be an honor. Anything at all. <laughs> that medallion must be worth a thousand florins. He must be cheating me. <laughs> Mm, Signore Fortunato, <laughs> I've been waiting for you to call on me at my villa. I've been waiting for your husband to leave town. Shame on you. <laughs> I'd wait till she could scratch on the storm. Nothing like a few welts to remind one of a night of passion. <laughs> oh, nice to see you. Nice. A bit like Montresor. Whatever became of him, uh, didn't you two have some dealings? I suppose we did. Bit of a wet blanket, Montresor. <laughs> 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 
Rich, rich. Are you looking for your wife? Don't tease me. Avoiding my wife. <laughs> I'd wait till she could scratch on the storm. Nothing like a few welts to remind one of a night of passion. When will they clear the streets of these scoundrels? They should be chained up. Who's that? Oh, Montes, oh, it's you. Fortunato. What a surprise. <laughs> it's a lovely party, isn't it? My celebration has just begun. My dear Fortunato, I wonder if you could help me. I've bought a small cask of what passes for Amontillado, but I have my doubts. Amontillado? Lucchese has a discerning palate. Perhaps he could take a sip. Bah! Lucchese can't tell Amontillado from gutter water! Let's go. Where? To your vaults. Let us go. A cask of a Montiano must have been cheated. It's unheard of. You are afflicted with a severe cold. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us return. I'll consult Lucchese. The cold is nothing. Look, Casey is an ignoramus. This is my coat of arms. What does it mean? No one harms me with impunity. Most unusual. It's dark in there. You won't get far without a torch. What a fate. I drink to the barrier that repose around us. And to your long life.
What's this? You're not a mason, are you? A what? You? Impossible. You jest. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Very funny indeed. Therein lies the Amontillado. The Amontillado! Pose your torch there. What's this? It is very damp here. One last time, let me implore you to return. No? Well, then I must leave you. But first... We'll have many laughs about it at the Palazzo over some wine. The Amontillado. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Amontillado. It's, it's getting late. My, my wife will be looking for me. Let us be gone. Yes, let us be gone. The love of God. My husband will be away all next week. Tomorrow's the day. We'll be rich beyond imagination.
But a man's family name has been dishonored. What's to be done? Your brother has dishonored your name. Seducing his cousin still in her minority. Once the dread mark is made, it cannot be struck out. We avoid complete disgrace only by taking immediate action. Immediate action. I can find a lead to her rooms. You are not to help them communicate in any way. Come in. Oh, cousin. Uncle Edwin has become very angry. He's, he's forbidden me from even speaking to Henry. Render me a service, won't you? Will you please, please take this note to Henry? You mustn't tell Uncle. I shall be forever grateful. I feel much better. Here, you play. I'll sing. Please? Come on. Oh, my! Blood! True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why do people say that I am mad?
priceless idea entered my brain. It haunts me day and night. You look as though you could use some hot soup. You don't want your soup? It's cooling. It's grown late. Good night, young man. Good night. Good night. Little by little, and he doesn't even dream. <laughs> <laughs> 
of my secret deeds or thoughts. <laughs> there. I know that groan. It's the low sound that rises from the bottom of the soul when charged with mortal terror. Many at midnight, it wails up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distract me. Yes, I it well. Oh. Poor old man. <laughs> He's been lying awake ever since that first noise. His fears growing, trying to fancy them causeless, but he cannot, because death, stalking with his black shadow before him, has enveloped the victim. I will vex me no more. Now, what shall I do with the body?
there, all deposited neatly between the scatlings. Replaced so cunningly, no human eye, not even his, could detect anything wrong. Nothing to wash out, no blood spot whatever. All has been caught in a tub. <laughs> Sorry to disturb you, sir, but somebody or other heard a scream or some such called us up. We've got to check these things out. What are you doing awake at this hour? That'll do, Finlay. Do come in, please, do. Well, what about the scream, Sarge? Oh, <laughs> the scream, sir. What do you know about anything like that? So that was I, Sergeant. I called out in a nightmare. I'm given to nervous fits. A gentle man like yourself? Well, what about the old man that lives here? Finlay! Gone to the country. Lucky man. Might we be looking about a bit? Of course, certainly, search. Check over there. The stove as well. Yes, sir. Sir. You'll want especially to look into the old man's room. Yes, look particularly here. In here, boys. Watch it. Sorry. Sit, sit, all of you. Do. Don't mind if I do. Of course, they don't suspect me. My manner has assuaged them. Indeed, they are delightful fellows. It's been a long day. He keeps his treasure in that drawer there. Oh, it's a lovely night, though. The stars are out in all their glory. Hasn't been disturbed, sir. Well, everything seems to be in order. Don't go. No, stay. Stay a moment. Rest yourselves from your various fatigues. Oh, my head. And what is that annoying ringing in my ears? Will they never be gone? And that ringing... But wait, it's not in my ears, it's... Oh my God! Can't they hear it? No. I'm safe. If only they'll leave. They must hear it. They must. And still. How is it they don't hear it? They hear. They suspect. They know. They're mocking me. Villains. Cr 
cruel villains. Stop, stop! I admit it. I confess. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. From Elise? Wait! I need your help. Edwin has become completely unbalanced. He's violently angry. He even refuses to call for a doctor, claiming her condition is due to my unnatural advances. We must conspire against him. We must take Elise from this dark place. You, my brother, you must help me. Ahem. The mistress Elise is no more. She is dead. It's my fault. All my fault. I loved her as I've never loved. I refused to believe she was ill. My mother, my dear, dear mother, died in much the same way. You must guard the secret of Henry's proposal. It only blackens her memory that she should die under indecent circumstances. Cousin, there was nothing indecent about my affection. Surely my grief compares with yours.
Please leave me to grieve properly. I ask only that you allow me to sit vigil just until dawn. Yes, it would be proper. Your brother will need light. Go fetch the lantern I was filling in my study. Good, set it here. It's late for him to still be out. He's a strange young man. A strange young man indeed.
Oh, good evening. Oh, good evening. Is something troubling you? Of course not. My, it's getting late. <sighs> Good night. Sleep well, old friend. Sleep at last. Ah, it's been a long, long day. Oh, mm. oh yes. I have determined to place my dear niece in the lower vault. The ground outside is far too marshy this time of year for a proper burial. Please light the way.
I made my descent to the cellar, my companions with their dreadful burden just steps behind. We penetrated into the dank basement, the lantern pushing back the darkness. What I could see in the black floated before my eyes. My eyes themselves felt as though they had turned to ice, and now sat chill and spiked in my heavy skull. These harrowing reflections haunted me until we reached the lower vault. We entered carefully and placed the coffin on two spindly wooden trestles set there for such a purpose. Our labor was without ceremony. Come now. Peace be with her. I can't bear to leave her here, all alone in the dark. Dear brother, do leave the lantern. Leave her a small source of light. We'll go back in the darkness. Ambers, seal the vault securely. Leave the key with me. Come, gentlemen. state of the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. The redness of the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores. The scarred stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim with the pest bands which shut him out from the aid and sympathy of his fellow men. The old seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court. And with these retired to the deep seclusion of his castellated abbey. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress nor egress to the sudden impulses of despair or frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatori, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within, without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raised most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends, 
had a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, this masquerade. But first, let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven. In the middle of each, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon the closed corridor, which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange. The fifth with white. The sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. In the corridors that followed the suite, there stood, opposite to each window, a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire. This projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme. It produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face, the hour was to be stricken. There came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause in their performance to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows each to the other that the next chiming of the clock would produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and there were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for color and effects. He disregarded the decor of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conception glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was. He had directed in great part the embellishments 
of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fete. And it was his guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. He sure they were grotesque. There was much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers, there stalked a multitude of dreams. And these, the dreams, right in and about, taking hue from the rooms, and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. Until at length, there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted. And there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And as it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus do it happen, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, that there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure. The rumor of the new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur expressive of disapprobation and surprise. Then, finally, of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have created such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. But the figure in question had out-herited Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seem now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, Neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet, all of this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow with all the features of his face was besprinkled with a scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers. He was seen to be convulsed with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, whereupon his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded harshly of his courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with his blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. But in the eastern or blue chamber, in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words, they rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of pale courtiers in the direction of the intruder, who, at the moment, was also near at hand. 
And now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker, but from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, every decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the cheating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which, instantly afterwards, fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and the corpse-like mask which they held with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. always acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. The life of the ebony clock went out with the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the Red Death held illimitable dominion over all. Have no daughters of my own. I hope you'll wear this. 
my wedding dress when that happy day arrives for you. When you feel dizzy, you must take a swallow of this. It will help mitigate the seizure. Also, I must counsel bed rest. Try to stay in as much as possible. Good morning, miss. I thought I'd look in to see if you're feeling something better. Yes. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Yes, miss. You never leave this room. Come for a stroll. He seems miles from here. Are you all right? I'm sorry. Berenice, will you marry me? Aegeus. Oh, Aegeus. Of course I will. I... Uh, I... Fetch the doctor. Find her medicine. He's made me very happy. I hope he hasn't asked me out of pity. No, 
Certainly not. Aegeus would look very handsome. Miss Berenice, you're soon to be married. Oh my, oh my. He's so distant. I hope he's all right. Aegeus? Darling? Oh, you're occupied. I'll return at a better time. A cheese doesn't look well at all. Perhaps I should get the doctor. I'm not well either. I must get my medicine. My medicine. My medicine!
She's alive. I know it. I can feel her blood flowing through the house. I hear her whisper. I hear her very heart. I've pounded at the door to her vault. I swear, I hear rustling within. Do you understand? She lives. Your brother has lost his sanity. Not even Ambers can restrain him. I understand you carried messages between Elise and him. Then come, carry one more. Henry is of an exceedingly sensitive nature. When such a man succumbs to delusions, it's best to bring him slowly around by way of that same delusion. He believes at least to be alive. Let him receive a letter from her. Deliver him this message. Let him believe it to be from Elise. Let him read by her own hand that she is no more. You must help me. After dusk? It's after dusk now! I tried to follow, but my haste made me clumsy. Finally, I emerged into the night. Elise! Elise! Elise, it's Henry! Elise, are you there? In, in the distance, I could hear my brother crying out. Elise, are you there? Elise! Elise, answer me! In the bright moonlight, I could see the rise and swell of the ocean from afar. The wave collected itself into a vast wall of destruction, then, then seemed to hesitate, poised in the moonlight. Then, with a terrific crash, the full force of the sea met the cliff face, shattering the calm of the night, surely forever! Miraculously, Henry had escaped. He lay panting on the cliff edge, then rose to survey the scene of his near demise. As I watched him, I saw a second silhouette emerge from the brush behind, and returned and pronounced the name I dared not utter. Elise? But it was not Elise. <sighs>
My wrath falls with certainty. Your brother was driven to insanity by breathing paint fumes from a lantern. You carried messages for them. You sang and flirted with her. You tried to save him. into another of her trances, she emerges ever more stricken and ever less the happy cousin I remember from my youth. Young man, our lineage has stood honorably for centuries. Her steady decline. Her steady decline. I will muse for long unwearied hours with my attention riveted to some frivolous device in the margin of a book. Or repeat monotonously some common word, 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 word until the word, sound word, ceases word, to convey word, any idea word, whatever word, to the word. mind. Berenice. Ever less the happy cousin I remember from my youth. but they occupy all my waking thoughts. Yours, Aegeus Pointon. Come in. Cousin, you never leave this room. 
Come with me for a stroll. Even in the days of her beauty, I never loved her. Yet she has loved me long. Her eyes have grown lusterless. Aegeus, are you all right? She has loved me long. Her eyes have grown lusterless. Even in the days of her beauty, I never loved her. Yet she has loved me long. Berenice, it occurs to me that perhaps we should marry. Ah, uh, Jesus. Yes, I believe we should. Perhaps come November. I'm... Help someone! Berenice has fallen! No, I'm all right. It's past. Kumis, you've taken another of your turns. Another of her trances. Another of her trances. Young man, our lineage... Ever less the happy cousin I remember from my youth. Her steady decline. Her eyes have grown lusterless. Perhaps we should marry. The day of our nuptials approaches. Approaches. She's almost gone. Quickly, young man.
Come in. Dearest Aegeus, the day is soon upon us. She's almost gone. Teeth. 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 It is only by way of the teeth that I can restore myself to peace and to reason. Just looked in on Berenice. She's, I, I can scarce say it. She, she is no more.
My lord, a cry in the dead of night. We went in search of my lord, her grave. Disturbed, sir, her enshrouded body. Bloody, yet still breathing. Oh, yes, alive. Oh, sir, lord. Oh, sir, what's this? No pestilence has ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood is its avatar and its seal. The redness and the horror of blood For me, the celebration has just begun. full import of the lantern, the madness-inducing fumes, Henry's premonitions. All these came clear to me at once, and I could feel and hear a great rending, as of a mirror breaking, roll throughout the house, growing in volume and strength. And even as I looked on, the house around us, the vault, the lantern, Elise, her bloody eyes, all shattered. Shattered into a hundred thousand shards, shattered as did the dark depths of my very soul. 